So hello, everyone. Good afternoon from Austin, Texas. Thank you all for joining us today and welcome to today's webinar, the Digital Collections Summer Love-In. My name is Elliot Williams. I use he, him pronouns, and I am the DPLA Aggregation Service Coordinator with Texas Digital Library. Uh, also with us today are several other folks from TDL, including our Executive Director, Christy Park, Deputy Director, Courtney Muma, Communications Manager, Leah DeForest, who's helping me out in the chat today, uh, and our soft, senior software engineers, Nick Woodward and Frank Smutniak are here as well, I believe. So on behalf of TDL, we're really glad to have you with us today. First, a little housekeeping. As always, please keep your microphones muted if you're not speaking, but we love to see your faces if you wanna turn your video on. So feel free to leave your video on or turn it on when you're speaking or leave it off if that's what you're comfortable with. We hope you'll use the chat box to say hello and let others know you're here, make comments, share resources throughout today's presentation. We'll also be sharing some links in the chat throughout the presentation for some of the information we'll share today. Uh, and if you have a question, please type it in the chat. We'll have time for questions and discussion throughout the presentation today. Live captioning has been enabled for the webinar, so you can view live captioning by clicking on the closed caption button on the Zoom toolbar. And finally, uh, this webinar is being recorded and we will publish slides and recordings on our website and in the TDL repository. Uh, we at Texas Digital Library are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. We ask that everyone here today be respect, considerate and respectful in speech and action, attempt collaboration before conflict, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior and speech, and be mindful of your environment and your fellow participants. And again, a reminder that we are recording the webinar and we will share the recording, slides, and notes with everyone who registered. And finally, Texas Digital Library is grateful to our members, many of you are here today, um, who put your trust in TDL to provide essential library infrastructure and services like digital preservation, digital repository hosting, tools for managing electronic theses and dissertations and research data, support for open educational resources, and metadata aggregation for DPLA. We invite any institution interested in becoming part of our consortium to reach out to us. We need your energy and expertise to continue growing the digital library community in this region and invite you to connect with our fun brilliant, amazing community of librarians and archivists. And so uh, I'm so excited to welcome you all to the Summer Love-In today. This is our second Digital Collections Love-In event that TDL has hosted, and uh, I've been looking forward to it all summer. Um, these events are an opportunity for our community to celebrate everything about digital collections. We know that a tremendous amount of work and effort and love goes into creating, maintaining, and sharing um, digital collections, and we want to celebrate that work. We want to give our community a chance to show off the really cool things that all of our digital collections contain. So at our first love-in, uh, we heard about the collections that institutions have digitized, the systems people are using to host digital collections, the strategies they use to engage their communities around digital collections and exhibits, um, and I'm excited to hear more about that and learn more from you all today. So we all know that Texas summers are very hot. So I went looking around in various institutions, digital collections for ways to keep cool and have fun in the summer. And so maybe you might wanna go fishing in a lake or go to a summer reading program at your local public library or roast some marshmallows around a campfire or eat lunch in a swimming pool for some reason. I don't really know the context of this photo, but I really wanna do this. Or maybe you just need a big ice cream cone. So whatever your favorite summer activity is, Texas Digital Collections have you covered. One of the reasons that TDL is hosting today's event is because we believe in sharing digital collections as widely as possible. And one of the ways that we help our members share their digital collections is through TexHub and TDL's DPLA metadata aggregation service. So if you're not familiar with the Digital Public Library of America, it's a project that aggregates digital cultural heritage materials from institutions across the country. It currently includes over metadata for over 46 million items, and that number is growing regularly. Um, it went up by 2 million items since I took this screenshot a few months ago. Uh, and all of those items are searchable through DPLA's site, and then users who want to view the item can link back to the institution's home repository. TexHub is the Texas hub of DPLA and is the pathway for Texas institutions to share materials with DPLA. TexHub is a joint project of TDL and the Portal of Texas History at UNT. As I'm sure most of you know, the Portal of Texas History provides services for digitizing, hosting, and creating metadata for digital collections. And metadata for materials in the portal has been included in DPLA for many years. 
TDL's DPLA aggregation service enables institutions that host their own digital collections, no matter what system they use, to share metadata about those materials with DPLA. So whether you host your own collections or share them through the portal to Texas history, your institution can be part of DPLA. Once materials are in DPLA, they can get shared in lots of different ways. So it really becomes kind of an, uh, a way for your collections to get seen by people who wouldn't know about them otherwise. For example, uh, DPLA posted some photographs from Houston Public Library on social media last month to celebrate Juneteenth, and a webinar on using DPLA for genealogical research earlier this year featured a collection from Stephen F. Austin State University. So there's lots of really cool ways that materials in DPLA show up. We'll include some more information about TDL's DPLA aggregation service in the follow-up email for today's event. And if you're interested in talking more about it, please reach out to me. I always love talking about it. Um, sharing metadata about digital collections with DPLA is a great way to reach new users and broaden the audience for the amazing digital resources that our libraries hold, which leads me to today's main event. So here's how the webinar today is going to go. Um, we have a great lineup of folks who volunteered to share their digital collections and exhibits. I've asked these folks to talk about their sites and collections, but only for a few minutes each. So I'm hoping it will be a fun, fast paced way for us to see lots of interesting and exciting materials. When it's your turn, just say your name, your institution and a little bit about your site, whatever you think is interesting, unique or exciting about it. I've split folks up into groups here, so we'll hear from a few people, then pause for questions and discussion after each group. Uh, for the folks who are speaking, please try to stick to no more than three minutes so we have uh, so we can get through all the great sites that we have lined up for today. Um, I'll be sharing my screen throughout, so folks who are sharing, feel free to tell me what to click on or how to navigate around your collection as you're speaking. Um, and all of the links to the collections are in the community notes document that Leah just dropped in chat, um, so you can explore these awesome materials on your own as well. Um, the, the community no notes document also has space for notes, so please feel free to edit that document and add your thoughts, ideas, takeaways, other cool things you know of that you want to share with folks, um, and we'll be sharing that document out in the follow-up email to everyone who registered today. As folks are sharing, if you have questions or comments for anyone, feel free to drop those in the chat as we go, and then at the end we'll have some time for additional sharing and discussion as well. And I think that is all of the preamble, so now let's get to the good stuff. Give me just one minute uh, while I switch from sharing slides to sharing my browser. And then Lauren Goodley, I think you are up first. Okie dokie. I do not know if I'll speak for three minutes. <laughs> we will see how that goes. That is great. My name is Lauren Goodley and I use she, her pronouns and I'm at the Whitlock Collections at Texas State University. And we just launched this spring. Whew, it's been a minute then. It feels like it was yesterday. We just launched a new digital collections platform. It was built in-house using Islandora. Before that, we had been using DSpace, which is amazing, but not amazing for archival materials. So now we have this, what did I just call it? Platform, sorry. So we're super excited. and. Uh, there are, I just wanted, thanks, um, Eric, for, uh, for Elliot, bleh, thanks, Elliot, for clicking on the university archives. That is not something I can speak to very much. Um, it is not my area, but we were able to, um, one of the things we did was build an application profile that would work for metadata from both the university archives and the Whitlock collection. So we're really excited that they can share that same platform that can either be like Elliot showed you know, click through and see the different collections and browse, or you can search across both uh, the University Archives and the Women's Collections. So yay, one thing that I wanted to show off was Action Magazine. This is a cool, it's a cool thing, man. It's um, like a local music rag that was published from, help me out here, 75, maybe through the early 90s. It had a quite a nice little run. So the early stuff is, it's all super fun. Um, and they're really nice scans and kind of fun to look through. Um, the nice thing about this collection is that it's fun to look at the ads, but it's also nice because, um, I don't know if you wanna go back just one. Yeah, you can see that we've, we've identified the cover um, information and who, 
so that you can find like Kinky Friedman was the cover in November 75. But there's lots of other artists that are um, local musicians in San Antonio and around San Antonio that are identified, that are in the collections. And so our metadata librarian, who is working to do some machine learning and try to pull those other names from the OCR text. So fingers crossed, I'm super excited about that happening because that's something that we're just not able to index on our own. So that's, oh, three minutes goes by fast. Okay, super fast then. If you scroll down to the other thing I wanted to show off was the Russell Lee collection. He was a photographer with, um, he did a lot of work for the federal government. So some of these materials are on the Library of Congress um, public site and they share the same title. So it should be super clear where those overlap. If you just wanna click on any of them, I don't know what's, the first one is a guy trying on boots, which was nice. Oh, that's so pretty though. Oh, that was sad. So the nice thing again about this that I'm super proud of is that this collection has been online for 20 years, I wanna say. <laughs> that was a wild guess, but it was an HTML until like two weeks ago. And um, I'm super, super proud that the metadata that we created and that Islandora setup that we created was captured everything that they thought was important 20 years ago. We had a place for in this metadata. So, um, and then it's, it is a beautiful collection. So if you, if you feel like looking at some of these on your own time, there you have it. Thank you so much. That's awesome, Lauren. Thank you. These are really cool. And I'm, I'm super excited about that machine learning project with Action Magazine. I want to look forward to hearing more about that as y'all yeah, work on it. I'm, it's not my project, but I'm proud of it and I'll report back. Awesome. Thank you. And up next, we have Sylvia from San Antonio Public Library. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Okay, great. Can you see me? No, you can't see me, but I'm here. <laughs> okay, here I am. All right. Hi. Thank you for um, inviting us. Um, we have the African American Funeral Programs, and it's hosted by the Portal to Texas History. And the programs were added to the collection uh, to the Texana Department in about 2005 by a, a Patricia Pickard. And what she was, she started with it started with a box of 25 programs and has since grown to 4,528 and they keep growing. The earliest one dates to 1930 and it can they contain a wealth of information to have family history. They have bios on the individuals uh, of the deceased. It's got the name, the birth of uh, death dates, uh, relatives names. Um, so also educational and work history, um, organizational and religious affiliations that are noted in these programs. And, and there's prominent um, individuals that are also noted. The Sutton family is a member of the certain family. The, the, the programs are in there um, along with uh, Lillian Woodward Sutton Taylor, and she was a civil rights activist and she was, uh, she was one of the ones that did the sit-in at the Woolworths and also have um, Ethel um, Minor. She was the first woman who was the president of NAACP. But then we have also just, just, just common regular people that are in there. Uh, the first librarian, the first African-American librarian is also included in here. But this, these programs have, a, like I mentioned, a wealth of information on the genealogy and includes a lot of uh, family information. Uh, the collection started uh, when we got a grant from the National Historical Public Records Commission. And uh, they were first posted, they were first sent out in 2010 and were first posted in 2012. And uh, since then, um, as I mentioned, that just keeps growing and growing. And they've been at, we've been adding them in, in batches. And right now there's 550 that are waiting to be scanned. Wow. And we've also had like over a million uh, uh, hits on it where people go in and visit the site. So it's a very popular one and it helps a lot. We send a lot of people uh, to, uh, that come and do the genealogy to go look through them if they have some of their relatives in there. 
So if you click on, uh, you can also do search. Like if you could put the person's name, you know they're in there and just click on any one of them and you've got the whole program that's listed. Um, and it's gonna, it's gonna, it's got the, the whole program itself. So it's a celebration of life and they're, they're really cool and very popular. Um, another one I was gonna show you was the uh, San Antonio Urban Renewal Project. And those are 10 of the books that were digitized and, and it's got the name, addresses, uh, and also com uh, comments that folks made. It's when they relocated the, um, when this when the government came in and took some of the, the property and then relocated people. And some of it is within the hemisphere area. So in there, it also has comments and uh, about how the person felt after they moved. And uh, once again, these also very helpful. And when people are doing house histories, uh, to see maybe what one of the older houses in the neighborhood looked like. But those were some of the also 10 of the um, books that were digitized that were part of also that National um, Historical Public Records Commission when, it was, uh, when we uh, applied for that grant. Wow, these are fantastic collections. Thank you so yeah. much for sharing them. Yes. And go in there and, and click on some uh, and also the funeral programs because those are very, very um, a lot of fun to look at, you know, it gives you the history of the individual. Yeah, and I, I love, like you said, that that's it's just a really like sort of the whole spectrum of people represented in there. Yeah, and it's just I just named off a few, but it's just also everyday people. And up until this day, we continue to get people that donate uh, the collection. That's the thing about the San Antonio Public Library. Um, we don't have money, so people are always. That's how our our collection, um, our archival collection, how it has uh, started is just by donations, and that is uh, those are just two of them. And luckily, uh, UNT, the Portal to Texas History was uh, able to digitize the collection. Thank you very much, Elliot. Thank you. Thank you so time. much, Sylvia. It's wonderful. Uh, next up, Megan from Southwestern. Hi, I am Megan Firestone. Uh, we are, I'm the head of special collections at Southwestern. And I wanted to share today an exhibit that we did um, that actually came out of a long kind of process, um, we first held a workshop with some of our faculty members to help think about ways that they could integrate special collections into their coursework. And one of the faculty there was a political science professor who says, I don't do history. And it's we've talked to him and said, well, you don't necessarily have to do research or history research. The collections can be used in a number of ways. And so let's find a way. And so she looks at how campaign and campaign memorabilia and all of that goes into elections. And so we said, well, we have all this campaign memorabilia because we hold the papers of Senator John G. Tower plus a number of other political figures. Let's pull from that. And so the, and then this was supposed to be an in-person exhibit that helped open launch our brand new gallery, but due to COVID, we couldn't launch the gallery. So we pivot and put this into Omeka and turned it into a digital exhibit which for the students they really liked because then they could send this out to all of their friends and showcase their work um, and it continues to live. So we still have students that come back and say, oh, I still get to show this off and tell people. And so it's actually worked out in a nice way. Um, if you wanna click on, and you're gonna need to click on the navigation bar on the left. Um, for some reason, the bottom one is not working correctly. I'm still fixing that as trading pink for policy. And so the way that this worked is the intro text that was on the first page was actually written by the professor. And then each of these sections was created by a group of students. And what they actually got to do is they came in and we gave them, I think it was an 80 page document of all of the campaign memorabilia that we could clearly identify. Um, and they went through and picked it. And then they came together as groups and figured out how everything worked together. And we worked with them on how you curate, how you create the item exhibits. And then because this now had to go digital at the other end, we scanned and got everything up, which created some headaches because some of these things, like if you click on the women for Nixon, which will take you to a larger 
it's a full packet. It had bumper stickers and pamphlets. And, and so we had to, so what we ended up on some of it is we only really scanned the front cover because we were like, we can't, because like that item had probably 30 pamphlets for Nixon. And we were like, we can't get all of this up. Um, and so this worked out as a really great learning. And the faculty member loved this so much that she's already booked herself to do this again for the next presidential election, um, which we're hoping will be physical, um, but we will, we will see. Um, and yes, the paper dress is very popular. There is interesting fact, there is actually a paper jacket that is supposed to go with that for men. Um, we have yet to be able to acquire the paper jacket. We do have the paper dress. It is also supposedly flame retardant until you wash it and then it's flammable. <laughs> um, so, but it was a really fun exhibit and I'm glad that the students have such engagement with it. Um, and so the lesson I really like to promote on this one is this was a great pivot moment that really turned out even better than just an in-person exhibit might have been for us. That's awesome, Megan. Thank you so much for sharing this. It's fascinating. And oh, I, no, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I no, go ahead. No, one. please. I also want to introduce uh, Christina. She is listening, um, is our newest member and will be over. She is our new digital initiatives and collections assistant. So she has taken on the charge of kind of working on our digitization and our collections. Awesome. Welcome, Christina. Glad to have you with us today. This is great. Thank you so much, Megan. I love this example. I love I love the idea, like you're saying, that the professor thought that there was nothing kind of in archives because she didn't do history, but but there's always something to connect with. All right. Next up is the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service Collection, and that was shared by Robert McGeechan. Robert, I'm not sure if if he is here today. I don't think so. So I'll just say a quick word about this. Um, it's a collection in Texas A&M's DSpace repository, and it's a um, pu publications from the AgriLife Extension Service. And it's I was looking through it earlier today, and there's material from like back in the 1920s up to today about agriculture and cooking and gardening, um, and it's just really cool stuff. And one of the things I was excited about is that it's I could see this being used in lots of different ways, um, which I think is always sort of exciting about digital collections. So that's our first group of collections and sites. Any comments or questions for that, those folks? I know there's been a lot of chats happening. There was one question in um, chat, Elliot, from yes. Rebels, asking, does anyone require funding for digitization with donor gifts? Anyone have any response to that? Thanks for the question, Rebel. Not hearing any response to that question about um, funding from donors, but if anyone does have thoughts about that, please please feel free to share them in the chat as we go along. All right, so starting off our next group is uh, Michelia from Southwest Research Institute. Elliot, you said my name right. Thank you so much. <laughs> I my practiced, really Leah, helps me, yeah, <laughs> Leah helps me get it right. I'm glad I did it successfully. I appreciate it. Well, similar to Megan, um, we pivoted as well. So our special collections, first of all, I'm Michelia Mason, she, her pronouns. I'm with Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas. Um, and we're, we're a nonprofit research organization and we have strictly engineers, scientists. So we're not affiliated with any organization or any university, um, but we do um, partner a lot for research. So there's both government research, commercial commercial research that goes on here. So that's what our library does is we support our the, the research. But our, our library also has a collection of rare books and special works ranging from the 16th to the 20th century. 
Um, and prior to COVID, we would have exhibits where our researchers would curate a collection of the works and tie it into their current project work. So we would see how Bricotti's work on fibers from the 1700s relates to our engineering dynamics department as they are testing um, how fibers react under different loads when they're being shot at in the ballistics room. So um, what we wanted to do is have a way to make the collection available um, to our staff who were working from home, to our staff who are offsite. And then also, this is the first time that we have a publicly available site for our library. Um, so if you scroll up a little bit, Elliot, there at the top, there's a, a link for the exhibits. In March, um, it, what, we were celebrating Women's History Month and we were asked if we could put together a virtual exhibit um, for Mary Somerville. And so Valerie Darling, who is here on, on this meeting today, she's our outreach and training um, librarian, but she did a fantastic job interviewing our space scientists um, in our, our space science engineering division. So if you just kind of page through that, um, you'll see some interviews. We've got um, audio clips um, and snippets of their feedback. And so they're kind of helping us demonstrate the importance and the impact of Mary Somerville's work um, in our current space science field. Um, and so what we've also done, um, as you scroll up back to the top, there's the browse the collection or the special collections link, yeah. So if you click on that, that will actually take you to the main page. And when you scroll down, there are some options to browse the collection um, and view the exhibits and community collections. But browse the collection will actually take you to the A to Z listing of the work that we have in our collection. So we've got Galileo, Einstein, Euler, um, Euler, <laughs> Euclid, um, Ptolemy, Aristotle, Newton. So it really runs the gamut of the foundational works that reflect the science and engineering work that goes on here at Southwest Research Institute. So we're just thrilled to have our first kind of ad hoc way to demonstrate um, our, our collection. Um, and we did, we used LibGuides. We just kind of bent LibGuides to our will um, to make this available. <laughs> um, so this is again, our first foray into making our collection uh, available to, to the public and also to our um, remote staff as well. This is so cool. Thank you so much for sharing it. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. I love the idea of, of interviewing the experts in, in your community and, and how that ties into the, the rare materials. I think yeah, that's so we fascinating. Yeah, so much. It's a really fun way to keep the exhibit, to keep the works relevant. Awesome, thank you so much. Next up is uh, Shelly from Texas Tech. Hi everyone, I'm Shelly Barba. I use she, her pronouns. I'm at Texas Tech University Libraries. Usually I deal with theses and dissertations, except for this one collection, and I love it so much I wanted to talk about it today. It's the International Conference on Environmental Systems. Now, what the heck does that mean? Um, the um, ICES, or ISIS, or now we call it ICIS because of the terrorist group, um, they're a conference that focuses on disseminating really hard technical and scientific information on the topics of humans living in space and living through extreme environments. And so if you ever watched like the movie The Martian uh, with Matt Damon, and you're like, wow, this is good, but I want to know way more of the hard science of it. This is the conference for you. It's an international conference, as they say, and um, every summer. So it's been it's been happening since 1971, but we've been in partnership uh, with them since 2014. Um, every summer, there's a week, and I am sent about 200 to 300 um, papers that are going to be presented at the conference. And I have a couple of days to get them into DSpace, and uh, we work really hard on that get all that through. Um, there's a lot of uh, author created metadata but going through and trying to fix that itself. And it is, um, other than our dissertations, our most heavily used um, collection, and it's used throughout all the world um, as Japan, Australia, all throughout Europe, Mexico, uh, different places doing that. Uh, as I said, every summer, these were just the new crop just published on July 10th. So this is hot off the press. If you want to know what is happening with space right now. Um, so there's, uh, you can see right there, the James Webb Space Telescope initial on orbit 
thermal performance. That was the one I was most excited to read about first. I don't know if y'all been following the Jane Weah telescope. It's very exciting. Pictures that we're getting from space. These are the like very deep of like how to do how how it do <laughs> all of the parts that have to happen in order to make space work. And um, the other thing I really like about the collection is there's a lot of stuff I would never have thought of, but are super important. So um, there was another one this uh, path about like how to clean clothes in space and the um, implications and difficulties that that would have. Also, if you ever wanted to know about a closed loop water system that involves a lot of urine, um, we have oh so many papers about that because people publish about it constantly. So if that sounds like something that you would like to um, look into or people you know or your library, check out this collection. It's a lot of like the hard, hard science, but um, that's, I will tell this one joke. It's not really a joke, it's real. There's a scientist, he lives in Germany. He writes extensively about the closed loop water system and his name is Water de Vet. Like water de Vet. How, how perfect is that that his whole life now is writing about urine but anyway all right that's enough of me amazing thank you shelly it's it's really fascinating and and like you said all these things that i wouldn't have thought were part of space science but half somebody has to write papers on very very cool uh next up we have the world war one postcard collection from texas a and m Bonnie or John, are either of you here to speak about this? Yes, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. And uh, I think Bonnie's here as well. You want to say hello? Hi, I'm Bonnie. <laughs> so um, actually, first off, I want to say, uh, throw out some props to Rob McGeechan. I'm sorry he wasn't here, but that is an awesome collection and really been, I mean, the past 10 years, he's in our AgriLife uh, digitization guru, and and it's a tremendous collection. But this is uh, you know something completely different. Uh, this digital collection is uh, combines actually two different uh, um, collections of postcards held in the Cooper K Reagan Military Collection at Cushing Memorial Library and Archives. Um, there's a earlier digitized collection of uh, British World War I postcards that were collected by uh, a noted English biographer named Dominic Hibbard. And then a uh, more recently digitized collection of postcards from a larger archive of World War I German and Austrian documents at Cushing. Um, so uh, I'll start off, uh, I'm gonna drop into the chat a link to, um, well, actually before that, Bonnie, did you wanna say something about the sort of technical side of of this collection, which is part of the reason we chose this. Sure. Uh, one of the reasons why we chose this collection was because this is the first instance where we were able to successfully aggregate materials from two separate repositories into a single mm. uh, display view. Um, we did that using SAGE, which is our solar aggregation engine that's being developed here at Texas A&M, open source. Um, a colleague of ours presented on SAGE earlier this year at TCDL. And if you do want to know more about that, since we don't really have time here, I will put a link in the chat. Uh, the PowerPoint presentation is at the bottom of that schedule page. Thanks. So um, the, the, com the, the two different uh, collections, uh, the first one, that I was going to highlight from the British is uh, it's noted for these hold to light uh, postcards. Uh, this is an example called Angels in the Night Sky, and it's kind of hard to see because uh, obviously you're, you're, when you scan something, you can't necessarily hold it up to a light. But if you did, the angels would appear in the clouds. Um, you can kind of see sort of the little like brownish spots, those are actually what they're supposed to be. Um, and so that that was a part of the, that uh, British uh, sourced um, uh, collection. The um, German and Austrian documents are really notable for their striking um, 
combat photography and images. Um, and really, uh, they're, some of them are, are pretty intense. Um, if you go back to the, the, the first page, uh, the, the, at the top in the banner, there's a, um, <laughs> this uh, World War II postcard, World War I postcard uh, that you can see partially is called the uh, called Überung von Warsaw, and that's actually stands for the bombardment of Warsaw. I'm going to drop that um, link in there, and it's uh, illustrated, but it's still, uh, as you can see, just even from the little snippet that's on the page, a uh, pretty striking um, image. And then uh, there's other a lot of photographs of um, battlefield. Um, images, damaged buildings, trench warfare. Um, so they can get pretty, pretty intense. And it's also noted that, notable that um, much of this uh, material really was unseen by um, in, in Western Europe and, and in, in America uh, because we didn't fight on the, uh, on the Eastern Front. And so, um, so, so this is a pretty unique uh, collection. These postcards, many of them were not um, sent. They were just hmm. printed onto like postcard stock, but but they were but but the English ones tend to be ones that were actually posted. So you have both sides of the postcard, so you can sort of digitally flip it over, which is nice. Wow! Right. Thank you so much. What an incredible collection. I'm. I'm fascinated by those, um, the hold up to the light postcards and, and kind of the challenge, like you said, of how do you sort of represent that digitally? How do you provide that experience? Very cool. All right, next, Susan from T-Slack. Hi, I am Susan Floyd. I'm the communications officer here at the Texas State Library and Archives Commission. And if anybody on the call doesn't know us, we are right next to the Capitol in downtown Austin. And we have a lobby exhibit gallery with rotating exhibits uh, with items just from our collections. Every once in a while we have things on loan, but we have so many millions of items that we don't get to display and put pretty small gallery space. So we rotate out mostly our exhibits there. Our current exhibit, which is closing on August the 15th, is called A Home for Texas History. Elliot is showing the homepage. I will put that in the chat if you want to go look at it. We also have a short video set that same link that I just put in the chat. Um, you can watch that. It's about three and a half minutes to give you an overview. This exhibit commemorates the 60th anniversary of our current building. Uh, before this, we were scattered all around. Some of the records were in the Capitol, in the basement, in very crowded hallways. Some of them were in a Quonset hut in Austin, which was really not a permanent building even. Um, and in 1959, Governor Price Daniel spearheaded the construction of this building that was purpose built to house the state archives. And we also have a large Texana and federal and state depository library collections. So if we go to our first item, I want to show you guys from this exhibit from our collections. I believe it is the Mission San Jose census. So this is from one of the six missions in San Antonio. It's called the Padron de los Indios or the census of the Indians, and it is from January 24th, 1798. So uh, this includes mission roles, uh, reports of foreign visitors, uh, statistical information. Most of them have the names of the people who were living there, including the Indians, um, and all the names of the family members. And there are just many, many pages of these census documents. Uh, these are now all digitized and available in the Texas Digital Archive. And these two pages that I'm showing, if you wanna go ahead and go to the next one, these are just a representative example. These are in our online exhibit and also on display in our lobby. So if you wanna come take a look, uh, but it's really cool, you can scroll through. And then obviously in the digital archive, you can zoom in so you can really see more of what's on each page. The next item that I picked out of the many items here is this really cool, and you, you can't get the full effect, unfortunately, of their photograph. Um, you wanna come in and see it. It is a treaty between the Republic of Texas and Great Britain from November 13th, 1840. So this was actually ratified and signed by Queen Victoria on May the 26th, 1842 and includes her signature. Sam Houston sent James Pinckney Henderson um, to London, Paris, uh, all different European capitals uh, at the outside of the Republic to try to get the Republic of Texas recognized. Um, and James Pinckney Henderson would later become the first governor of the state of Texas. 
So uh, that's another interesting connection. Uh, this one gets brought out every once in a while for special view, but it's really cool. And again, you can't completely tell here, but it's in like a velvet lined box and it has its official seal. It's a very cool uh, document slash artifact. And the next thing is, oh, this one is fun. You've all probably heard of the William B. Travis letter from the Alamo, which we had on display at the beginning of the exhibit uh, back in April around the, or March and April around the time of the siege of the Alamo anniversary. Uh, now it was dated February the 24th, 1836. This is an earlier letter that people don't seem to be as familiar with. Um, that's maybe not as spectacular as signing your letter of victory or death, uh, but it's pretty interesting. It's dated February the 13th, 1836, and he was writing to acting Governor Henry Smith regarding the command of his post at the Alamo. And if you go on to the next one, I've also provided a link to the transcription here. Um, you can find this in the online exhibit. You can click through to read the whole transcript of the letter if you're interested. But the part that's really interesting to us and kind of funny is he mentions Jim Bowie and he says there, Bowie was elected by two small companies. And since his election, he has been roaring drunk all the time, has assumed all command and is proceeding in a most disorderly and irregular manner, interfering with private property, releasing prisoner sentenced by court martial and by the civil court and turning everything topsy turvy. So that is a really fun historical document. And that's some of our evidence for a lot of the portrayals you see of Bowie at the Alamo in subsequent movies, films, TV shows, et cetera. And then finally, uh, one more artifact. Um, as I said, part of this exhibit is about showcasing our purpose-built facility here. So this is one of the architectural models from 1961. And if you've been here, if you come see us, you can see it's pretty accurate. This is pretty much exactly what the building looks like. We still have our six flags and our seals and everything out there. So I would encourage everybody to come visit, uh, click on the link that I put in there. You, if you can't make it to Austin, every single item in this exhibit, like all of our exhibits, has been scanned or photographed and is available on our website. So you can virtually visit the exhibit as well. I'm sorry I went over time. It was inevitable. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. That was great. This is really fascinating stuff. And I uh, want to go visit the exhibit now. I might do that very soon. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions or comments for this group of presenters before we move on? All right, hearing nothing. Let's go next to uh, Michelle from the Hill Archive of Texas Artisans and Artists. And uh, I should mention that Michelle and her car colleague, Margaret Culbertson, uh, won a TDL Excellence Award this year for their work on the site. So I'm excited to learn more about it. Thanks, Elliot. And uh, yes, we were excited to receive the award as well. Uh, so the Hill Texas Archive, which we call it for short because it's a lot of words, uh, were hosted at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston at Bayou Bend. And we've built this digital database uh, based on not only our collection here, but in addition to two, 22 or more now, I believe, uh, partner institutions and contributors and a number of private collectors, as well as descendants of artisans and artists throughout the state. And so we have a very large database filled with uh, records that are either cataloged by occupation or if they're object examples by the object type and materials. And so we have some really interesting uh, uh, records such as uh, unpublished research materials from curatorial files throughout the state. Uh, we just wrapped up a three-year project at the Woody Museum in San Antonio, and we have excerpts from their um, Texas artists' files and Texas artisan files that have been compiled over the last hundred years by curators and researchers. And we've got uh, a number of objects that are really interesting in that they are being cataloged for the maker and not necessarily for the content. And because we include printers and lithographers, we've got a lot of pamphlets as well. Uh, some interesting ones that I thought of after listening about the funeral programs is that we have a lot of sermons from the Dallas area. And some of these uh, collections that we focused on are from notoriously hard to access materials, such as uh, museum curatorial files, which are typically not open to the public unless upon request, or uh, also uh, collections that have been in museums that are now shut down and are collects packed up in a, in a basement somewhere, or other uh, collections that are in private, private hands that have never been on display, as well as um, uh, oh, I had it and I forgot it, but so we have several different ways to access 
the materials from our homepage and in on each landing page for these sets, there are uh, suggested research uh, uh, topics that such as images of artisans and artists. Uh, you can search by um, the type of material or form. We also have uh, divisions, categories such as African American artisans and artists, itinerants, Mexican American, Native American women, and uh, uh, other types of materials that are grouped together are day books and account books, and uh, as well as uh, I think I said it before, but um, the marks and signatures of artists and artisans, so items that are signed or contain some sort of inscription by the creator. And we are forever adding so many more. Um, we are now looking at the, the valley. And so we're going to be partnering with institutions uh, along the Rio Grande. And we're really excited to get started on that section of the state since we've been um, mining through the easier, larger cities for the past few years. Yeah, it's the Hill Archive. Thank you, Michelle. I also have already spent hours looking through these materials and will continue to do that because there's just incredible stuff in there. Uh, next up, Kimberly from Texas Women's. Uh, thank you, Elliot. Um, I'm going to make this quick because this is a little different uh, digital collection and actually what um, our di this, this particular digital collection, our Voices of the Coronavirus Pandemic, um, actually spurred something that we didn't plan, and it was a very organic collection um, that happened, but it wouldn't have happened had we not had this amazing digital collection that our manager, and I, she was on here, I think she may still be on here, um, she moved on my screen, so I'm not sure where she went to, but Kristen Clark was our, is our manager of digital collections, and she created this for us um, last year, and um, this particular collection is primarily born digital materials that came in and uh, about people's experience and, and what was happening with them with isolation and remote learning and, and, and just their own personal experience. But what happened with this collection is, or very organically, we actually got another collection that came from this. And, and um, everything that was happening in the greater um, you know, discourse of our nation and everything with the Black Lives Matters movement and the protests, we started connecting um, with people who were reaching out to us that had stories, that wanted to share those stories. And um, they were looking for that validation um, that their story mattered and that it was important and, and, and that what they were experiencing um, was part of that living history that, mm -hmm. that needed to be captured. And while we had not planned anything to, to go out there and create any kind of effort to collect that history, we certainly became very interested and started you know, talking with, uh, some of these were our students, former students, some of them were other family members that were, were being suggested to contact mm -hmm. us. And what we found is that this, these stories were really, they are important and they do matter. Um, the interesting thing in going through this is we found out that a lot of these uh, people who had these stories that they wanted to share really needed for those to be shared at a little bit later date. So our digital collection is not up yet for that because what we found oftentimes was that sometimes there was a young child that they wanted to be a little bit older so they could explain what was going on. Um, one of the uh, people that we talked with was actually, they had a family member that was incarcerated and they wanted to wait and see what the judicial system, how that was gonna play out for them. And so really what we saw in this was why archives and why special collections, there's so much more than just collecting that history, that human connection at a time when people were really needing it and, and what was happening in our country, you were seeing that for reverberation happening with the people we were act, you know, we were interacting with. So we were really excited that our, our coronavirus collection spurred something and 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 people felt you know, people recognized they had a story and they felt like they could develop that trust and that relationship with us to let us be stewards of that. So we're really excited that we could be on the front lines and do something like that. We're even more excited 
to know that, you know, in, in the coming months, we can start working on this digital collection and we can get more of it up. But I think it really speaks to the power that these collections have, and they take us in directions that we never knew that we would be going. That's incredible, Kimberly. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I really think that's so powerful, like you said, just that that collections like this can can help people understand that their stories are meaningful and important and and valuable. So thank you for sharing that. Up next, we have oh, I'm losing my computer screen here. Uh, the Casa Sola photograph collection from UT El Paso. Claudia or David, I believe, was going to share about this with us. Oh, uh, this is Claudia, and uh, I was was up in the mountains, and I wasn't expecting to present today, but I came back down, and fortunately, because David was having some technical problems logging on. I'm glad but you could the, join us. Uh, the Casa Sola collection was a bunch of boxes of negatives that were found in the building where the Casa Sola studio had been. And uh, the workers who were clearing out the building took the boxes across the street to a pawn shop and asked if they were worth anything. And so happened the person behind the counter was trained as a librarian and also he was an artist. So he bought them from the guys for not very much money and then realized he couldn't do anything with them and offered them to us at the UTEP library. And there were like 50,000 unidentified negatives in this collection. And so uh, it was one of the first collections that we scanned any uh, part of. And, uh, and over the years, we've tried to uh, do sort of a crowdsourcing uh, effort to identify some of these photos. And people have really uh, enjoyed looking at the old photographs. And we still get lots of uh, calls when the El Paso Times uh, puts them in, uh, puts a picture in their newspaper on Sundays and says, do you know this person? You might uh, try uh, to, uh, try looking for um, Urea, U-R-R-E-A. That was actually the first photo we had that was identified. And it's a picture of the longtime Mexican consul in El Paso. And so a lot of people I recognized him, but actually his son, also named Roberto Urea, walked into the library after this picture had appeared in the newspaper and said he could identify uh, his father and the other members of the family. And we've had some great stories uh, come in with the phone calls. We always look, it gives you a reason to look forward to Monday because they appear on the Sunday paper. And uh, we hope someone will call in on uh, Monday and give us a little talk. There's another one that we got a big uh, response from. Her name is Losoya, L-O-S-O-Y-A. Yes, uh huh. This is one that David, our photo archivist, who was going to be presented, scanned. It was a damaged negative, but he was able to to get a really good image from it. And this picture was taken maybe around 1940 or 41. But a lot of people called in and recognized her, maybe because of her light colored eyes or something. But she ran a little grocery store in Isleta, which is a little town south down the valley from El Paso for many years. And uh, she had died just a short while before and her, and it, but the picture appearing in the newspaper prompted her kids to look through her papers and they found a whole cache of love letters that she, that between her and her husband who was, who was in the Pacific in the 1940s on a ship. And, uh, and so they, they called the, local uh, TV station and the TV station did a feature on her and her love letters. So, but if you, if, do you have also have the link to the Zlobovsky? Do I have time to talk about that too? I don't have the link handy. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. And we, are, we are running short on time. So okay. I think we should yeah, maybe well, move on. But we, uh -huh. Because we are here on the border, we have a number of immigration related collections. And actually we did, we use the Casasola uh, photos 
the scans from those to create an exhibit uh, that, to help with an exhibit on immigration. But uh, one of the, another collection that we digitized is the one like a manuscript collection that we completely digitized is the Fanny Zlobovsky National Council of Jewish Women uh, case files because um, most of the, the, the immigration collections we have are very large and that wouldn't lend themselves to a digitization project. But the, uh, but the Jewish women's group here helped immigrants from Europe in the 1920s, 30s and early 40s fleeing fascism. And so they all, because of immigration uh, limitations, they weren't able to immigrate directly to the United States. So many of them went to Latin American countries first and then would mm -hmm. come in through El Paso to the United States when they would find sponsors or get their bureaucratic paperwork done. So people should take a look at that. I mentioned in the chat that that's a collection where some of her descendants or family members offered to help us digitize it. And they gave us a donation. And uh, it turns out the letters were so fragile that we had to do it in house. We couldn't outsource it. So we have those funds we're maybe gonna use for translation purposes. I was going to have you uh, pull up one of the folders that has, has a correspondence in a language that I can't read. There, some of the letters are in Yiddish and they use a he kind of Hebrew script, which is very hard to even to identify for us anyway. So yeah. we're thinking about having the Yiddish and uh, uh, letters uh, translated. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you. Um, if you want to drop those links in the in the community notes document so folks can take a look at them or in the chat, that would sure. be great. Sure, I'll, see, I'll, 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 I'll see if I can pull that up. Thank you so much, Claudia. Uh huh. All right. And thank you. I've had a really good time hearing about other people's collections. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> All right, last but certainly not least in our last few minutes, Whitney Johnson Freeman from UNT. Thank you. Um, mine will go really fast, I promise. Um, so I'm Whitney don't, Johnson I don't Freeman. mean to rush you. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I talk fast anyway. Um, so I wanted to share this collection that I've been working on for the past year and a half. Um, starting in January of 2021, um, we had this push to promote the research and grants being awarded to UNT researchers. And this is where this collection originated. So this is the homepage of the collection and you're feel free to click around Elliot and I'll speak broadly about the collection. Um, so it basically contains data management plans for grants awarded to UNT researchers. Um, so some grants are exempt for various reasons from the funder to maybe they contain information um, or data that is not meant to be made uh, public. But um, we have 90 DMPs right now, but it is constantly growing. Like literally I got one this morning. Um, I get one just about every day. Um, so I wanted to share it because I think it has a valuable resource uh, for others looking for examples of accepted DMPs, not just um, examples that are kind of has like John Smith in the filler like these are things that were actually accepted by funders um, and they have active grants associated with them um, so we have a range of topics from library science to deep space transit and um, they range in the amount of detail they provide as well so some uh, were created using the DMP tool, others uh, are funder uh, templates, and some are entirely unique. Um, so hopefully this will appeal to uh, a little bit of everybody. The next phase of this collection will include adding inventories of publications and data sets for their respective grants. Um, so users will be able to follow the grant from acceptance all the way to research outputs. Um, so I hope you check it out, and I'm just glad that I get to share it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Whitney. I'm really glad you shared this. This is really cool. I also like that that's two mentions of deep space exploration in this webinar. It's not, I think, what people associate with library digital collections. 
All right. Well, we are just at about two o'clock. So sorry that we didn't have time for more kind of questions and discussion at the end here. But um, this has been wonderful. I've loved I've loved hearing about everyone's collections and the great work that everyone is doing. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for everyone who shared your collections with us today. Um, like I said, I'm just feeling really inspired and energized by hearing all the work that that folks are doing around the state. Um, as I said, we will share out the captioned record recording of this webinar as soon as we can. So feel free to share it with uh, anyone you know who might be interested. Uh, we are hoping to do more events related to digital collections in the future, so please be on the lookout for those. Uh, and as a final reminder, we here at TDL would love to have you join us. Please email us at info at tdl.org if you'd like to learn more about TechSub and DPLA aggregation or any of our other services. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Take care, stay cool, and have a great rest of your day.